Before I dive into Eulers and Quaternions and all that good stuff, I first want to cover rotations on a more basic conceptual level. Without thinking about it too much, rotations seem like a pretty simple affair. You have an object, and you can spin it. But in fact, it's not as simple as that. Well, it is that simple, but not all the time. <clears throat> Ahem. Okay, let me start over by summarizing what I'm about to talk about. There are two main things that I want you to get out of this video. The first is the difference between rotations and orientations. The second is how much more complex 3D rotations are than 2D rotations, and the ways that this affects rigging. So let's start with the difference between rotation and orientation. In short, orientation is where something is, and rotation is how it got there. Or in other words, orientation is a position, and rotation is a change in position. Hopefully that's fairly intuitive right off the bat, but I'm going to give some examples to help illustrate. Imagine we have a wheel with only one spoke. It's not a wheel you would want in your bicycle, to be sure, but it's useful for this demo. Now if we spin this wheel by different amounts, that spoke ends up in different positions. The position of that spoke represents the orientation of the wheel. It's just where the wheel is right now. By contrast, rotation is a change in position. If we tell someone to spin the wheel 90 degrees to the right, we're talking about rotation. It doesn't matter where the wheel started, the wheel could have been in any orientation. But the rotation, 90 degrees to the right, is the same in all cases. In computer animation, this distinction between orientation and rotation often gets blurred. And that's because we typically use rotation to specify orientation. We have a neutral starting orientation that we consider unrotated, and then we specify other orientations by applying different rotations to it. Incidentally, it's actually the same with location and translation. Location is just a position. Translation is a change in position. But we specify locations using translations. We choose an arbitrary reference location, and then we specify other locations with a translation vector from that starting point. But you could, if you wanted, apply that same translation to any location. So orientation is like location, it's simply a position. And rotation is like translation, it's a change in position. And if we think about animators for a moment, they're really animating the locations and orientations of objects, not their translations and rotations. But they're using translations and rotations to specify those locations and orientations. Most animators, of course, never think about this distinction, and for the most part they shouldn't have to. Hopefully that all makes sense. If not, then I guess I've failed you, and you should probably ask for your money back. Not that I'll give it back, but you... well, anyway, moving on. The next topic is 2D orientations and rotations versus 3D orientations and rotations. Let's start with just orientations, since they're simpler and they'll help to lay the groundwork for understanding rotations. So, 2D orientations. They're pretty simple. We can represent the 2D orientation of an object simply with a point on a circle. Wherever that point is, it represents a different orientation in 2D space. Now if we unwrap that circle, we can see that fundamentally, 2D orientations are actually a one-dimensional affair. They're just a point on a line. It would only take one number, or one dimension, to fully define an orientation in 2D space. Does that make sense? I really want to drive this home. Two-dimensional orientations are a lot like one-dimensional locations. They can only vary in one way, along a line. The only difference is that orientations are on a curved line that wraps back on itself. But the idea is the same. They are both a one-dimensional kind of thing. Kind of weird, huh? So what about 3D orientations? Are they two-dimensional? Well, no, they're three-dimensional, meaning you need at least three numbers to fully specify them, which is weird. Or maybe it's not so weird. I guess what's really weird is that orientations in 4D are six-dimensional, and orientations in 5D are ten-dimensional. Come to think of it, 3D space is really the only one that makes sense. All the others are kind of freaks. Aren't you glad we live in a 3D world? Anyway, all of this is beside the point. The only thing we care about here is that orientations in 2D space are one-dimensional, and orientations in 3D space are more than one-dimensional. 
but why does it matter that 2D orientations are one-dimensional and 3D orientations are not? The reason it matters is because of how it impacts 2D and 3D rotations. So here we are now, finally talking about rotations, and this is where the real mind-bending begins. So I've already made the distinction between orientation and rotation, but there is a further distinction to make between two different kinds of rotation. The first is what I will call a rotation delta. With rotation deltas, the only aspects of the rotation that we care about is the difference it creates between two orientations. Or in other words, all we care about is that this orientation changes into this orientation. We don't care how it got there, we don't care whether it spun this way or that way or how many times it spun around, all we care about is the effect it has on orientation. So spinning the wheel counterclockwise 180 degrees and spinning it clockwise 540 degrees are exactly the same thing as far as rotation deltas are concerned. So that's rotation deltas. The second kind of rotation is what I like to call a rotation path. With rotation paths, we care not only about the shift in orientation, but also about how it got there. We care what direction it spins, for example, and we care how many times it spins. Rotation paths are important information, for example, if we have two objects connected to each other, like a head is connected to a body with a neck. If the head spins around one time, it's going to have a very different effect than if it spins around 20 times. It can also be useful for animating wheels, where we can tell the computer that it starts unrotated, and 100 frames later has spun clockwise 30 times. But why am I calling this a rotation path? All I'm really talking about is preserving the number of revolutions of a rotation, right? Couldn't I just call it rotation revolutions, or rotation spin count, or something like that? Unfortunately, no. There is more to this than just the number of times an object spins around. You can get a hint of why this is by noticing that the direction you spin is important, not just the number of times you spin. And this is where the one-dimensional nature of 2D rotations, and the non-one-dimensional nature of 3D rotations, comes into play. You see, in 2D, the direction of the rotation is such a simple piece of information, just left or right, that it's easy for us to think of it as a minor thing just something you tag on to the number of revolutions. But the reason it's such a simple piece of information is because 2D rotations are one-dimensional. It's like giving directions to a person who exists in a one-dimensional world. Hey, how do you get to the bank from here, good sir? Oh, just go right 20 meters. Thank you very much, good man. Ahem. Could you please step aside so that I can pass? I think not. With 3D rotations, however, we have a lot more options. We're not just moving along a single fixed line. We get to choose our line. It's a lot more like giving directions in real life. How do you get to the bank from here, good sir? Head south and take a right on 5th Street and keep walking until you hit Jackson. Actually, I think it's faster to head west and take a left on Jackson and keep walking until you hit 5th Street. Personally, I prefer to take the subway. It goes directly there. I just wander around until I find it. Goodness, multi-dimensional spaces sure are confusing. One of the really sad implications of this is that the concept of revolutions is only meaningful in a limited set of circumstances. Revolutions are predicated on the notion of a single fixed looping path. It's simply the number of times you've traversed that path. With 2D rotations, that's not a problem, because 2D rotations are always a fixed looping path. But in 3D, we have no such guarantees. The path could be anything, and it certainly doesn't have to form a closed loop. And that's why I call this concept rotation paths, and not revolutions. Rotations, and in particular 3D rotations, are a lot more complex than that. When animators and riggers want the number of revolutions of a full 3D rotation preserved, they're actually asking the impossible. You have to preserve the entire path of rotation, not just the amount that it rotated. Although, and I'll get to this later, there are some cases where you can preserve revolutions for animation and rigging, although they all rely on predefined rotation paths to a greater or lesser extent. But for 3D rotations in general, it's not always possible. So to recap, orientations are where an object is, rotation deltas are a simple difference or change in orientation, and rotation paths are a full recorded path of how an object rotated to where it is. 
So after this weird theoretical ride through the topic of rotations, you may be wondering, how on earth is this relevant to rigging? Well, one way that it's relevant is what I noted just a moment ago, which is that the concept of revolutions is really only meaningful in 3D in a limited set of circumstances. Rig controls that rotate freely on all axes, like arms, aren't going to fit the concept of revolutions very well at all. On the other hand, rig controls that have a clear primary axis of rotation, like wheels, are great candidates for revolution-preserving controls because they are much more like 2D rotations. All of this weird theoretical stuff also strongly influences what rotation representation we choose for different rig controls. Some rotation representations, like Euler rotations, have very clear rotation paths. Other rotation representations, like quaternions, are much more like rotation deltas and don't care about the rotation path. And these differences between rotation representations will inform which rotation representation we choose for each control. Lastly, understanding all of this weird theoretical stuff will better equip us to work around or even exploit some of the behaviors and properties of 3D rotations, as well as better inform us when we can't really work around them. So now that we have this background in place, let's move on to the real meat of this topic, the different rotation representations available to us in Blender.